the Russian elite sees the world a little bit differently still. And here I'm talking about those who, who run Russia today with Mr. Putin, around Mr. Putin, and in that relatively small group that enjoys uh, the, the cream at the top of the milk in Russia. From their standpoint, the world is fundamentally a complex and basically a dangerous place. And if you think about this, this makes sense, generationally, right? Who are these folks? Where were they in their careers in the late 1980s and early 1990s? As the entire system which they expected would respect, appreciate, and reward their progress simply crumbled around them. This is a group of people whose life experience is informed by the loss of all predictable things in both personal and professional context. And with this, a sense of the indifference, sometimes even the schadenfreude, with which this would greet it in the West. And that is particularly still a kind of root of trouble in Russia-West interaction. And of course, Russia's well-known dependency on energy and commodity exports, I hardly have to talk about that, has an important effect, which is to narrow most questions of state power and state capability to questions of commodity prices. And any of you who work in that industry can tell the one thing we can say about the price of energy, for example, is that it will fluctuate. That we know for sure. And that means that if your state depends on that price, everything depends on a fluctuation which is fundamentally uncertain and unpredictable. But as the edifice of the state becomes more and more central to Russia's resurgence, right, the story of Russia coming up from off of its knees in the post-Soviet collapse period, regaining prestige, regaining prosperity, by the same token, the centrality of the state, the almost absolutist dominant centrality of the state, makes Russia less resilient. Think of things in a political context, like civil society, political pluralism, as part of a portfolio theory for your investment in Russia's success. Russia has a very non-diversified portfolio. And that further, for the Russian elite, makes their experience brittle, unpredictable, and uncertain. A second important part of the Russian elite worldview is that Russia belongs, indeed, it, it is of a right to be at the top table among global power players. And yet there's almost always a recognition that Russia will need to work with others in order to carry the day or to have its way. And generally, among the universe of possibilities, working with Europe, with the West, with the United States is a first choice. But Russians are not willing to sacrifice what they view as Russia's independent foreign policy solely in order to have partnership or approval from the West. And in this respect, Russia is unusual among many world states, which are perfectly prepared, whether temporarily or for the long term, to subordinate their interests in order to have the partnership or approval that they can receive from Washington or from the West. But by the same token, remember, Russia knows that it cannot any longer be the senior partner to China, so there is not a convenient, obvious alternative. Russia turns away from the West, turns instead to China. Instead, Russia now sees a kind of middleman or a brokering role, the opportunity to be a key player on some of the issues that Ambassador Burns mentioned, uh, the Iran nuclear program, Syria, uh, even the crisis in Libya, and now ISIS. Russians believe, again, I'm talking here about the elite worldview, that they are unique in being rational actors when others, in particular the United States, are far too influenced by politics or indeed by hypocrisy. And here, of course, they point to the American apparent obsession over human rights, for which we rake Russia over the coals, right? Think of the emphasis about Pussy Riot, this group of, of punk rockers uh, who, in fact, really did disrespect or desecrate a Russian cathedral, versus how little we say now about women's rights in Saudi Arabia. And of course, the West's obsession with Iran's nuclear program in the first place, when from Russia's perspective, Pakistan developed a nuclear weapon, and we more or less said, gosh, that's a shame, and moved on. Or why is it that despite their own quite robust traditions of strong neo-nationalism, fascism, uh, and various other strains of extreme politics, a number of the countries of the former Warsaw Pact were welcomed swiftly, and in many cases uh, with, uh, with uh, short shrift, paid to the requirements into NATO and the European Union. Again, from the Russian elite perspective, this is seen as fundamentally 
illogical uh, and hypocritical.